It's a brave thing to stand up to your enemies, but it's braver when you stand up against what people think of you and how they expect you to spend your life. This is a golden lesson that our protagonists in this movie will learn. The story is inspired by the real-life events involving Harry Hallows and the way he claimed possession of a vast property of land. The movie is set in the idyllic town of Hampstead. It's a quiet place where people from all walks of life gather to find either a temporary or permanent home. Emily Walters is one of its residents. She is a widowed American living in a posh apartment. This apartment happens to be right across from an abandoned hospital and a vast property of land. Residents call it Hampstead Heath. Because of this location, a construction firm named Brevon International plans to acquire the property and build luxury apartments there. For Emily, it's a waste to demolish the hospital, as it gives quaint, peaceful vibes, especially since it's covered in luscious vegetation but it's none of her business. She has more important matters to address, like her financial situation. Even though she owns an apartment, she's deep in debt and tax payments. Her remaining money will not last her that long. Meanwhile, Donald Horner is a homeless person who is known among the residents as a tramp. But it's not true that he's homeless. Not technically. He has a shack built from scratch, and it's located within the premises of Hampstead Heath. He grows his own food, generates his own electricity, and takes his baths in the river nearby. Sometimes, he would make a bottle of wine and trade it for a loaf of bread. He has never disturbed any residents, nor has he received any complaints from them. He simply continues his life as a loner in the woods. But since Brevon International wants him out of the property they want, he's been sent multiple eviction notices. The last time an agent does this, Donald pulls out a carrot from his box garden and uses the notice as a wrap. Then he gives it to the agent as a gift. What a badass. To put her mind at ease from her financial responsibilities, at least for a while, Emily volunteers at a charity antique shop. She always greets Eric, the young man who's always distributing flyers for any available cause. Then, after her shift, she attends a meeting with a semi-civic group, whose members are all middle-aged women. Their leader Fiona facilitates the meetings. They all own the same posh apartments as Emily, and they all belong to the affluent families of Hampstead. They think it's their duty to uphold the utmost civility in their area. For example, Fiona proposes for all of them to support the demolition of the old hospital across from their apartment block. Wouldn't it be good if they have a luxurious building to look at, instead of a decrepit old hospital? Emily wants to object, but Fiona drowns her objections. Even though Fiona thinks of herself as a friend, Emily thinks otherwise. She has a feeling that Fiona is doing what she's doing because she sees her as some sort of charity case, especially since her husband passed away. She doesn't feel good about it, but she doesn't have any choice in the matter. Later that day, Emily meets her son Philip. Philip has just visited his father's grave. It's been a year since he passed away, which Emily had forgotten. Then he tells his mother about the accountant who's been calling him about his mother's financial problems. He advises Emily to do something about her situation. He loves his mother, but if he has any problems with her, it's that she would always shrink back when facing a problem. He won't always be there for her, since he's about to get a new job, and he'll be transferred to a different place. Emily is shocked to hear this, but she understands his son's concern for her. Philip suggests to her that she could sell some things that she doesn't need anymore. So, Emily heeds his advice. The apartment has an attic where the residents put their unwanted things. She pulls a box full of old things toward her. She sees a photo album. When she opens it, she sees a photo of her and her late husband. She immediately closes it, feeling all the pain and burden that his passing caused her. Next, she sees a dusty old pair of binoculars. She uses it to look out of the attic window. From there, she sees the woods that surround the old hospital. When she pans downwards, she sees ripples on the surface of the river. It turns out someone is taking a bath in it. She recognizes that person as Donald Horner. Her spying ends when she receives a phone call. It's from James, Fiona's accountant. He wants to meet her, to discuss her poor financial status. He invites her to an expensive restaurant. She's tight on her budget, but she helplessly agrees to the meeting. The next day, Emily meets with James. He's an odd man, who reads account statements very well. He can see that she is indeed in dire need of advice on money matters. Their meal becomes disturbing, as he creepily holds her hand in an attempt to offer help. Whatever he means by that. Apparently, Fiona has talked to him about her being a widow, and suggested to treat her in this restaurant. Emily feels uncomfortable about it, but she pushes through, because she thinks he can help her with her financial mess. After their meeting, she decides to check on the homeless man through her binoculars. It's fortunate that she does, because she sees a couple of men attacking the tramp. She immediately calls the emergency services. The police and ambulance arrive on time, saving him. The next day, Emily intends to check on him. But Fiona and the others are gathered around the foyer to discuss their new goal, preventing mobile phone masts from being put up in the heath. They are supposed to gather signatures on their petition, to be presented to their local council. Fiona assigns her to Hampstead Lane, near the heath. Emily does her part, for the sake of saying that she's involved in this apparently worthy activity. But she's not exactly taking it seriously, because that's not what she wants. And people are ignoring her. 
Then she sees a pathway that leads towards the woods of the heath. Tired of standing and persuading people, she walks along the pathway, until she arrives at the little shack in the middle of the woods. Many garden boxes, containing a variety of crops and plants, surround the shack. She calls out to its owner, but no one is answering. Then she sees the carrot wrapped in the eviction notice. So, the man is having some problems with the property. Later, she walks toward the cemetery, as she remembers that the other day was the anniversary of her husband. Once there, she can't help but let out all her resentment towards her husband. It turns out he cheated on her. And when he passed away, he left Emily in debt. In her frustration, she throws her boot onto the tombstone, causing her boot to get destroyed. She walks away from the tomb with nothing more than uneven shoes. Then she walks past the tombstone of Karl Marx. But what catches her attention is the tramp sitting there. Donald is brooding over something. He would have not noticed Emily, had it not been for her phone he walks away, not wanting to communicate with another human being. But Emily is insistent. She asks him if he can sign the petition for preventing the construction of mobile phone masts. He turns around to tell her that he doesn't care about what other people do, as long as it doesn't concern him. He even says that she doesn't have any stake in it. Emily protests, saying he doesn't know her. He sarcastically counters that apparently, she knows him, and his house. Emily admits that she's the one who called the police the other night. She also confesses that she was using a pair of binoculars to spy on him. Donald is taken aback by this. He may be a gruff man, but he knows when to acknowledge kindness. He thanks Emily for her intervention the other night. They formally introduce themselves to each other, then they go their separate ways. When she comes home, Emily receives another tax mail. She gets a newspaper, where she finds out that Fiona's husband, Rory, is behind the support for building the new luxury apartment buildings. When Fiona calls her to check on the signatures, Emily tells her that perhaps this petition is not a good idea. In addition, her husband is behind it, so she should have been honest with them, instead of making stories up. But Fiona simply deflects the veiled criticism, and insists on Emily doing her part. That afternoon, as Emily eats her dinner in the attic, she decides to check again on Donald. She sees a large tarpaulin, where he's written an invitation to her for dinner. So, at 7 p.m. the next day, she goes to Donald's shack. Once there, she sees a note on the door, claiming that he's gone fishing in the river. Along with the note is a map. Emily follows it until she sees Donald, calmly sitting on a chair while waiting for his catch. Fishing is a new experience for Emily. She did not expect to find simple joy in waiting and anticipating a fish to bite the bait. On the other hand, Donald finds it interesting to teach another person how to fish. Or rather, how he does things. Both of them enjoy their time fishing. After they catch their dinner, Donald invites Emily inside his house. Perhaps she's the first one that's been cordially invited by him to enter, unlike muggers or other intrusive people. Emily finds the interior surprisingly cozy. Sure, nothing is new, and everything is either secondhand or gotten from a dumpster. But it's clear that each item has been well taken care of. All have been collected and put together to create a comfortable home. Donald looks at her, and feels grateful that she appreciates the effort he put into his shack. Emily sees an oven, and thinks it's functional. But he corrects her, saying that it's only functional as a fireplace. It was donated to him by a man he calls an arse, years ago. They grill the fish they caught and have a candlelit dinner. Emily says Donald is unlike any tramp she has ever known. He looks cleaner. Then she brings up the eviction notice she found the other day. Donald gets the paper from her and throws it into the grill. He says they can't evict him, because they don't know him. But Emily is not satisfied with this answer. She asks him how he can be so calm, when a huge corporation is after the land where he had built his home. It would not be a huge problem, if the land is his. But he's considered a homeless person, with no land title whatsoever. He must do something to fight back. Donald becomes defensive. He asks Emily about her life, then he judges her for caring for him, when she herself is not satisfied with her life. He has touched a sensitive nerve, so Emily decides to go home. Rain is falling hard when she gets home. To add to this sour ending to the night, she sees a letter pinned on her door. Fiona has written the petition letter that Emily is supposed to write. Emily still doesn't agree with this petition, now that she knows the story on both sides. She decides to take matters into her own hands. The next day, she asks Eric's help to make flyers about Donald's situation. For now, she'll focus on this newfound purpose. That is, to help Donald stay on the land. And it works. Soon, it gathers enough attention that a group of protesters meet at the heath. Donald sees this, and looking at the flyers, he knows that it's a nonsense idea. He soon finds out that Emily is behind it, when she comes to visit him that afternoon. He says he doesn't need any help, because he's fine living alone without it. But she insists that he does, especially when he's against a large corporation. She wants him to stand up for himself and fight back. Donald questions if she has ever fought her own battles and won them. She doesn't answer, but she knows that his fight for his right to remain on the land has become hers. Emily comes home frustrated. That's when she receives flowers from James the accountant. And an invitation to another date. But he still creeps her out. Not to mention that their only topic is about her poor financial situation. Emily comes home from the date feeling drained. 
Then she decides to check on Donald through her binoculars. The tarpaulin is still up there, this time with a written invitation to meet him at Carl's. She realizes he means the tombstone of Karl Marx, where they first met. Emily proceeds to the said location the next day. From there, Donald tours her around the cemetery, which is near Hampstead Heath. They decide to have their picnic under a tree. For the first half of the picnic, they talk about simple things, like why Donald likes to hang out at the cemetery. Then, Emily opens up again about the topic of gathering supporters for his cause. Donald becomes riled up again. He bursts out that he's not anyone's charity case. He won't go to any courts and attend hearings, and he'll definitely not lose his home. Amidst his outburst, Emily catches two words, court and hearing. With no choice, Donald shows her the subpoena sent to him. It indicates that Brevon International is taking him to court for immediate eviction. Emily points out that this is serious, and that this is exactly why he needs help. Finally, Donald admits that he doesn't know where to begin. They end their picnic early to visit downtown. Donald looks spiffy in his Panama straw hat and faded blue coat. Emily is impressed. They visit an attorney for legal counseling. Donald's story has been published on the tabloids, and it has garnered the public's sympathy. Donald reveals that he's been living in the Heath for 17 years. The attorney says that normally, one must be living on the premises for at least 12 years before the judge can give the lot's title. He also says that it's usually the judge's discretion that gives the final decision, so he advises him to show himself as a decent old man when the hearing comes. This is because if he remains gruff, it will not help him win the judge on his side, especially since it will fuel the stereotype that the corporation paints him to be. Donald has no choice but to take note of this. After their legal visit, the pair decide to go to a museum. In the last few days, Emily and Donald have grown comfortable with each other. At their age, they are already familiar with the feelings blossoming between them. They can afford to wait before they tell each other how they feel. But for now, they'll enjoy each other's presence and focus on important matters. When they get back to Donald's shack, they find it ransacked and ruined. He's devastated to see that the home he built has been destroyed by people who don't like how he lived. Emily invites him to sleep in her apartment's attic until they can find a solution for his destroyed house. The next morning, Emily and Donald wake up by each other's side. She decides to prepare breakfast for him while he takes a bath. Emily is focused on frying eggs and bacon. That's why she gets shocked when she sees her son Philip visiting her. She has no choice but to give him the breakfast she made for Donald, who is enjoying a luxurious bubble bath. Philip is casual in talking with his mother, but he senses that she's hiding something from him. Emily denies this. How can she possibly hide something from him? Right on cue, Donald dances into the kitchen, wearing a robe and a towel on his head, and his face covered in a mud mask and cucumber slices. Philip is speechless, and so is Donald. He apologizes for barging in so unceremoniously. Emily introduces him as a very handy handyman. Philip can't bear the awkwardness, so he leaves them. Later that day, Emily goes to Donald's house to inform him that the hearing has been set. It will be in a week. Then she gets surprised to see Eric on the roof. He has decided to help Donald reconstruct his house, because he believes in free housing, especially for the elderly and homeless. Together, the three of them work to restore Donald's home. By the end of it, they feel satisfied to have finished the restoration. Or at least, Emily and Eric are satisfied. Donald is still not comfortable receiving kindness and attention. After their hard work, Donald and Eric decide to take a swim by the river. A few minutes later, Donald joins Emily by the grassy riverbank. There, he relays to her his life story. Donald is from Dublin. When his mother passed away, his father neglected their farm. Deciding that he'd had enough, he left home. He traveled to other places and countries, until he ended up in London. There, he met Valerie and fell in love with her. However, their romance was short-lived. Valerie passed away due to cancer. Donald decided to move on and travel again. He ended up in Hampstead 17 years ago, where he settled in the Heath. Emily realizes that he's experienced so much in his life, and she thinks it's a good cause for a small feast. She tells him that she'll prepare their dinner, then she comes home. Unbeknownst to her, Fiona and their friend group have organized a surprise birthday party for Emily. Apparently, that day is her birthday, but she forgot. Emily is so taken aback by this. She can't tell them that she doesn't want to spend her time with them, that she needs to leave as soon as possible to prepare for dinner. But, to make this worse, James the accountant is also there, leading a band of ukulele players. They sing to her the happy birthday song. But the way they sing it is more appropriate in thriller movies than in celebration. With this, Emily is worried about how she can inform Donald. She decides to tell everyone about him. But before she can reveal his name, Rory, Fiona's husband, comes in and reports about the tramp who's gone up to the attic. Emily is horrified, knowing it's Donald. Everyone immediately runs up the stairs to see for themselves. Donald stands there, as unbothered as ever. Everyone thinks that the tramp has been secretly sleeping in the attic. Emily attempts to explain, but she gets overruled by others and their assumptions. James even tries to defend her, and pushes her away from Donald. Disappointed, Donald walks away. Her last string of sanity getting cut, Emily conjures up an absurd horrifying story about her, and the tramp that makes everyone shut up. 
Then she goes after Donald. He stops to listen to her explanation. She says that she's been leading James on so he can fix her financial accounts. She knows it's wrong, but she has no choice. That's why she feels humiliated. She's afraid of what he'll think of her, of what has become of her, if he finds out about her problems. Thankfully, Donald is fine with it. He's known for a long time that Emily is not perfect. But she has shown him genuine kindness and interest. And that's enough for him. A couple of days after, Emily and Donald head to the court to attend the hearing. Donald's story has garnered the public's interest, so much that media outlets are also there to cover the event. But they have one goal in mind. That is, to defend Donald's home from getting leached by Brevon International. By the attorney's advice, they are going for adverse possession. It's a legal process where a non-owner occupant of a piece of land can be given the land's title after a certain amount of time. In Donald's case, they need to prove that he's been living there for 12 years, which is the minimum requirement. But the battle won't be easy for him. Brevon International is building up the case based on Donald's stereotype. The previous agent who visited him says he's a rude man who doesn't care about others. Even one of Emily's so-called friends testifies that Donald has only been there recently. When it's his time to testify, Donald feels so small, despite the huge public support. The lawyer for Brevon knows where to hit him. He points out Donald's incapacity to contribute to society, therefore, he must be a liability instead of an asset. At that point, Donald realizes he needs to stand up for himself and speak his truth. He says that he's been growing his own food, generates his own electricity, and doesn't bother anyone. In the 17 years that he's been staying in the Heath, he's made a home out of nothing. He may have no witnesses, but that's because he stayed out of everyone's business. He's aware that his way of living may be different from the normal, and that not everyone likes the idea. But it's his home, and it's important for him. In that regard, he's not that different from everybody else. Emily and Donald are back at his house. It looks like the judge is turning to his side. But Donald's greatest enigma is proof. Any document, witness, or incident that can prove he's been living there will greatly improve his case. Emily suddenly remembers the person who donated the oven fireplace to Donald. The one he calls an arse. They visit him and request him to testify on Donald's behalf. Fortunately, he does. His name is Mr. Fife, and he can attest that Donald has been living there for 17 years. He donated a lot of things to Donald, because he himself had once been homeless, and he knows how it feels. He also helped him build his shack, in which he accidentally hammered a nail into his finger. As proof, he shows the judge the medical certificate. Finally, Donald has given what he needs to win the case. The judge grants him the title of the land. And it's not just a small piece of land. He is granted the title to Hampstead Heath, a vast piece of unoccupied land. Everyone rejoices at Donald's triumph. Deep inside, he's happy to retain his home. He couldn't care less about the rest of the land, all he wants is to continue living there. A few days after the hearing, Emily and Donald have a serious talk about themselves and their plans for the future. Emily wants to be with him, but she can't stay in the shack. At her age, she can't survive on carrots and parsnips and fish, if it's even available. She wants her and Donald to find a home together. She faces this dilemma because she has received the final notice from the bank. She must settle her accounts, or she'll go to prison. She can sell her flat and then spend the money to pay her dues, but where will she go? On the other hand, Donald doesn't want to leave this place. This has been his home. He even thinks that Emily wants him to sell the land, so she can take some of that money. But that's not the point. Emily wants them to be together, but not in this way. She wants them to be more comfortable as they spend the rest of their lives together. Donald won't budge, so Emily has no choice but to leave him and let him go. In the next few days, she sells some art pieces and home decor, including the binoculars. She also sells her flat. Then she pays Fiona whatever amount she owes her. She ends their superficial friendship. She tells Fiona to keep up that facade of being morally right, even though it's making her miserable. As for Emily, she will spend her own life the way she wants it, regardless of what other people say. After this, with the help of her son, she moves to a lovely cottage near a river, just outside of London. She still misses Donald from time to time, but they have made their decisions. Until one day, Donald arrives at her cottage. She doesn't expect him to be there, that's why she's speechless. He tells her that he spread fake rumors about him, so people will leave him alone. Also, he traded the land to Brevon for a barge, where he can still have his shack and travel by the river. He realizes that his home is not the land, but where he makes it. And he wants to make a home with Emily. He tells her he loves her, and she feels the same way. They finally spend their love-filled days together, living their lives as they see fit. 